All right. Well, once again, happy uh, Resurrection Day to everybody. Thank you, uh, RB, for uh, praying with us and sharing that. Uh, actually, to be honest, that was part of my message today, so we can all go home. Uh, tapos na. Okay, happy Easter, everybody. But that was really powerful. Thank you, RB. Um, again, I, I hope you all had a good week. All right, I know a lot of people, I think there are some of you who are online. Uh, somebody messaged me and uh, some of you are watching from uh, out of town, but some of you, how many of you stayed in quiet Manila this week? Okay, all right, good, good. Um, and so um, whether you're out of town now or you're here, uh, welcome. I hope you had a good week, a Holy Week break. Uh, today is uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday, as many have, uh, have called it now. And usually we... we I don't know if you know this, we celebrate, we worship on a Sunday primarily because uh, that's the, the day Jesus resurrected. Uh, the Jewish people uh, uh, would, would worship on a Sabbath, which is a Saturday, right? Uh, so we don't worship on a, on a Saturday, we don't worship on a, on a uh, uh, Friday, even Good Friday, but usually on a Sunday because that's when Jesus resurrected from the dead. At the same time, Paul said, do we worship on Sabbath? Do we worship on this day, on that day? Every day we can worship God, even as uh, our beast said, that we offer now our bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord. Our worship is unto Him. And so, glad that you could join us today on this, uh, uh, on this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And so, again, could you go ahead, go ahead and smile at the person beside you and say, I'm glad you're here. Tell them, uh, grateful that you are here with them. All right. Now, I know we do have people in the overflow room uh, thank you for joining us as well. Now, let me start off with this question. We do have a lot of ground to cover today. Last week, um, we started a, a series entitled Place of Grace. Uh, we talked about Peter and how the Lord restored Peter back to his faith. Um, and we'll continue on in that thread as we talk about this next one in our installment, the second installment in the series. But I want to start this with this question. Was it really necessary for Jesus to resurrect from the dead? If you think about it, was that necessary? I mean, he died on the cross. Wasn't his death sufficient to pay for our sins? All right? Or could God have just set a cosmic pardon? Telling everybody, oh, okay, you are now all forgiven. Right? You are okay and we are reconciled. Was it necessary to, for Jesus to still be resurrected from the dead? What's its significance. And that's where we pick up our story today in, in, in John, or sorry, Mark rather, chapter 16, verse 1. Mark 16, verse 1. The Bible says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, and Salome, all right, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And when they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling or for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they had said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us I pray that our hearts would be filled, Lord, with, with just your love today. That they would, but we would all understand what that means, Lord, that you came and you rose from the dead. And that, Lord, today there's power behind that truth. And I ask, Lord God, that as we go through Mark chapter 16, that there would be just a level of excitement to hear, Lord, even from that very first Sunday when you rose from the dead. To fully understand and grasp what happened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now context, what happened here was, of course, Jesus was you know, crucified. He was, uh, he was placed on that cross in Calvary. But prior to that, he was scourged. You know, and, uh, and if you've heard, I was reading an article about that by uh, uh, a guy named Dr. Maxwell, where 
you know, when they would use a cat of nine tails, it's, a, it's not your regular leather whip. It was a whip with lead balls and lead uh, and pieces of glass and some bones so that it actually scrapes off the flesh. And that's the kind of scourging Jesus got, uh, went through. And it was 39 lashes, 40 minus one. So that when Roman officials or Roman soldiers would make a mistake and over, because if, if it goes over 40, they're the ones going to get lashed, right? Or they're going to they're gonna get whipped. But usually, they, they do 39. And so that's what, what Jesus had to go through. And then nails were driven through his hands. Um, I don't know if you know that, that it was most likely on his wrist, not on his hand. Not this place because it would rip off quickly. And so it would be right in between and missing out the median, no, not the median, the, the radial artery so that it will not, he would not bleed out to death. These guys were expert executioners. They would know where to dri drive that nail, hit the median nerve. If those of you who have gone through uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, that's the median nerve. So imagine just being pinched and pierced throughout the day with that uh, with that nail on the median nerve. And so Jesus was crucified uh, at that, you know, uh, with those circumstances. But on top of that, because he was on the cross, um, he, gravity would pull him down, right? And he would, you know, a lot of people died of suffocation more than the bleeding out because of the lungs being crushed. And so every time you had to breathe, you pull yourself up so that you can breathe. And every single time that you pull yourself up, it's a new crucifixion all over again. And so these are the kind of things that Jesus had to suffer so that you and I could, uh, you know, be set free from sin and death. And so now we pick up this, our story today in verse 1. When the Bible says, when Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint them, right? Mary Magdalene. These were the women who saw Jesus uh, crucified rather in Mark chapter 15, right? It's interesting to note that the men weren't there. Where were the men? They were hiding, right? They were hiding, Right? So could you imagine the conversation? Hey, where's Peter? Hey, where's John? You know, all these women were talking. And all throughout the time, you know, they would be together. But where, where, where are I? Where, where's these men? Okay. You know, and, and I don't know if they were joking around or they were just uh, wondering where they were. But they were not there. The boys weren't there. Okay. And, you know, just a thought here. God was elevating women, actually, in the, in the, you know, during those days. Uh, they were second-class citizens. In fact, what happened was uh, even their testimony in court was not credible. Imagine, why would God choose? Okay, in culture that day, women were, their, their, their credibility was the same of children or even of slaves. And so God was choosing the women to bring about, you know, this, this witness and this testimony. And God was actually doing something here also uh, behind the scenes. And again, uh, God was... Uh, the, the women brought the spices. The Bible says Jesus died before Sabbath, which is why they could not fully prepare his body for burial. And so when they would put spices, just I don't know if you know this, uh, they would usually use the linen, okay, and use about 75 pounds of spices, myrrh, aloe, different kinds of spices, so that you know, because there was no embalming at that time, at least for the Jewish people, they would not embalm. And so they would use that to at least cover the, you know, the, the smell of the cadaver, right? And so they would come. And now think about this. A day and a half, Jesus had already been in the grave and they were about to come in. Now imagine the smell, okay? Imagine the, the stench. At least if Jesus were still dead, right? And so, and yet they kept, they, they, because for their, because of their love for their master, okay, they went anyway. One of the people that was mentioned was Mary Magdalene. If you remember the story of Mary Magdalene, she was one who was gravely ill. She had a lot of infirmity. The Bible tells us in the gospels. And then seven demons were casted out of her. Now imagine that, okay? Somebody who had infirmity, somebody who had demons oppressing her night and day and then being set free and then meeting Jesus, understanding what Jesus has done for her. 
Now she gives her life to Christ. And now her master is dead. And because of her love for her master, she goes to the grave. She goes to the tomb site. You know, there are things that are not pleasant that we do for Jesus, but in to honor him and to, to, to worship him, we do it anyway. Love often prompts people to do things that seem impractical and useless. Right? And some of you here, you've done that for Jesus because you understand. Kind of earlier, we thought about when the Jesus first met us and we were saved by him. If you traveled and journeyed back to time and you remembered when God saved you, okay, out of that kind of experience and even just remembrance, your, hopefully your love for Jesus will continue to be rekindled, if not already. Right? That understanding that, Lord, you love me so much, how dare I not love you back? And so, you know, I, I don't know if you remember about seven, a uh, few, several weeks ago, there was a couple who gave their testimony here. Their, name is, name, their names are Paul and Jana. They gave their testimony. They were living in for a couple of years, and then they became Christians, and they gave their life to Christ. Jesus saved them, if you remember their story. And then after that, um, uh, they were, they're getting married their big wedding is April 28th, this year, this, this, this next month, right? But they felt they wanted to get married, even in a small ceremony, so that they can honor the Lord because they were already living together. And so that did not make sense to a lot of people. It didn't make sense to some of their friends. It did not make sense to some of their relatives that why not wait for just April 28th because that's already the big wedding. I mean, sure, you're living together, but wait. But they said, no, I wanted to, we wanted to obey the Lord and we wanted to be able to honor God in our relationship. And so, which is why they got married in a small ceremony uh, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago. And I tell you that because sometimes what we do for Jesus may seem impractical and useless to other people. But if it's coming from a love for God and it's worship unto Him, Jesus accepts that. And so now here we see in verse 2, and very early on the first day when the sun had risen, uh, they went to the tomb. And then, um, very early on the first day, all right, um, Sabbath was the, res the reference to end their week, okay? Uh, if you notice, there was no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for them. They would usually say on the first day of the week, the second day, third day, fourth day. The seventh day was the Sabbath. It was their rest day. And so very early on the Sabbath day, they came, all right? And um, verse 3, look at verse 3. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? Okay, from the entrance of the tomb. Looking up, they saw the stone that rolled back. It was very large. A question, who moved the stone? Who moved the stone, right? And it wasn't a soldier. It wasn't the disciples, right? Um, the Bible tells us in Matthew 28, there was an earthquake. And the angel of the Lord moved the stone. It was God who moved it. God who moved the stone. And you see, the stone was rolled out not to let Jesus out, but to let people in. Sorry, I'm having a hard time listening. All right, can I just use the, the microphone there? Maybe that's better. All right. Okay, adjust the lang. Parang Gary V. Ganyan. Sige. Um, the stone was rolled not to let Jesus out, but to let people in. How many of you know Jesus could go through the walls? All right. Remember there was a, uh, the story, they were having uh, dinner, they were having a meal, and then Jesus showed up. And then what was his first words? When everybody was alarmed and afraid, peace. Patawadin talaga si Jesus eh, no? Okay? When everybody was uh, afraid, all right? And so, verse 5, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Now, the Bible says the angel was on the right side of the tomb. How significant was that? That, Well, not quite significant, not really significant, but it's a literary tool that biblical, biblical writers use to tell us the authenticity of the account. 
In other words, when you look at it, it doesn't seem significant. Okay, it's the right side. But when you give specific details, it tells you this is authentic. It's a literary tool by the biblical authors then to tell us we're not just making this up. This is not fake news. This is not, you know, something that we're manufacturing. And so they were alarmed. Okay, the Bible says, no question, who wouldn't be? Right? You were coming in, you were wanting to, you know, clean up uh, Jesus and his body. And then suddenly the, the stone is rolled away. And then you're there, you, you see somebody who's a, the Bible says a young white man, okay? Or on a white robe, rather. Young, young man in a white robe. It's like, that would be quite a shock if you see uh, that moment or that circumstance. Right? You come into there, you're ready, you're ready to, uh, you know, uh, fix up the body of Jesus, right? Um, and the kids, and the kids, the, the ladies were, were surprised. Uh, verse 6, then he said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. He says, don't be alarmed. Now, I also want to say this, that some of you, that might be the word of God for you today. You're hoping to sit, come into a situation and it's not the situation that you had expected. Jesus says, don't be alarmed. You're coming into a place where in your life today, okay, I had expected this, but this is now what is in front of me. God says, don't be alarmed. You're in a situation today where you realize, okay, I had planned this all these years, and yet now this is what I see in front of me. God says, don't be alarmed. And I feel that's the word for some of you today. Don't be alarmed. And then he says, he has risen. He's not here. These are powerful words. He's not here. He has risen. He's not here. The one that you're looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, he's not here. He's now no longer laid on the tomb. He's no longer wrapped in linen. He's no longer lying down on the grave. He is not here. He has risen. Verse 7, look at this. But go tell his disciples and who? Wow, special mention. Right? Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. Now think about this. Previous to this, Peter just denied Jesus. And he feels like a failure. He runs away, goes back fishing. Remember our story last week? He goes back fishing, goes back to the place where God told him, that's no longer who you are. This is who you are. I have given you a new calling. And he's gone back to his old self. He's gone back to his old place. He's gone back to his old location or even his old life. That's not where you're supposed to be, Peter. And some of you, you've gone back. God's calling you and telling you today, that's not where you're supposed to be. And he's calling you back to your real calling. And so now, the angel says, go to Peter. The disciples and Peter. Imagine that. Special mention got throughout all of human history. Right? Now, after seeing this, they were told to tell the disciples, right? Now, we're, if, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay, these are the four Gospels, right? And there are similarities to the stories. In John chapter 20, this is John's account of the Easter morning or the Sunday morning of the resurrection. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. She was excited. She was ready. You know, this is Jesus, the one that saved me from the seven demons, that healed me from my infirmity, while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Who's this other disciple? John. Okay. How do we know it's John? Well, the next statement, it says, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, okay, he wrote this, his, this gospel account. John, okay, and he referred to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. I, mean, I just love the Bible because the Bible doesn't sanitize, you know, personalities, all right? Bible has dual authorship, the Holy Spirit and 
the author, right? And so the human author, dual authorship. And so he says, uh, the Bible says, the one whom the, uh, Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. So they're now wondering where Jesus is. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple named John, okay? And they were going toward the tomb. Look at verse 4. I, I love verse 4. Look at verse 4. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He just had to let everybody know I was first in the tomb. You got to love this guy. They're too funny. It's like, I probably would have written it this way also, okay? I mean, just I'm telling you, this guy, John. Um, anyway, verse 7. Go, let's go back to, to Mark chapter 16. But, but, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. Tell his disciples and Peter. I love that. Jesus knows your name. Tell Peter. This was to assure Peter that it doesn't matter what you've done. I still love you. And I feel that's a word for some of you here today. You failed. But God says, I know your name. I'm still calling out your name and I'm calling you to myself. See, when you thought God has forgotten you, because you failed him, he calls out your name to remind you that you're actually still in his mind. He's thinking about you. I love what the Bible says in Psalms when it says, how precious are your thoughts upon me, about me. If I were to count them, it will outnumber the sand and the seashore. You know how much God thinks about you? The thoughts he has about you outnumber the sand and the seashore. How much do we think about God? Not very often sometimes, right? We forget about him. But Jesus, God, he doesn't forget you. He remembers you. Commentator Will, William Barclay said it. It was a characteristic, characteristic of Jesus that he thought not of the wrong Peter had done him, but of the remorse he was undergoing. Jesus was far more eager to comfort the penitent sinner than to punish the sin. Okay, so what do we do now? The tomb was empty. Now, people were wondering who stole the body. Go ahead and go ahead. It can't be the disciples because the disciples are in hiding. Right? Because there would be a Roman soldier there protecting the, the tomb. Right? Or guarding the tomb. So it can't be the disciples because if the disciples would, be, would show up, then they would, you know, they would be identified. Number two, it couldn't, have, it couldn't have been the women because the women didn't know where Jesus was. They were already asking, where is the belly? Is the body? Now, it couldn't have been the Jewish leaders because if it were the Jewish leaders, the very fear they had that people would think Jesus resurrected from the dead would actually happen if they stole the body. So they wouldn't do that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 to 66, look at this. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive after three days, I will rise. Therefore, Order the tomb to be made secure until that third day, lest the disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Okay, go and make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And so it can't be also the Roman soldiers because the Roman soldiers were told to, gu to guard. And so it'll be a breach of their duty if they did not take care of the tomb or if stole their body or Jesus' body. So it can't be the women, it can't be the disciples, it can't be the Jewish leaders, it can't be the Roman soldiers. 
Matthew 28, verse 12 to 15. Look at this. When they had assembled the leaders and the elders' council, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep him out of trouble, keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and they did as they were directed. And so the story has been spread among the Jews to this day, to the day of this writing. And so what was he saying? He's saying they spread a lie that the disciples stole the body. And so it could have been, it can't be the women, can't be the disciples, can't be the Jewish leaders, it can't be the soldiers. One only possible explanation, he did rise from the dead. Now back to our question. Was it really necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead? Okay. I'll give you, let me see how much time I have, okay. In a few minutes, okay. Um, Reasons, okay. I will try to give you as fast as I can. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus declares that we are justified before God. Justified or justification. Somebody said it this way, just as if you've never sinned. When you stand before Jesus today, because if you give your life to Christ, if you confess Him as Lord, you've been justified. It's just as if you've never been saved, uh, sinned rather. And the resurrection of Jesus allows you to be forgiven fully. Because Jesus won over sin, death, and the grave. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins. And was raised to life for our justification. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. What Paul was saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we would still be in our sins. Then why even go to church? Then why even read your Bible? Then why even do these religious things or these spiritual things? Faith now becomes futile. Because no, we don't, we can't. We, there's, we're just playing religious games. But Jesus did not just stay in the grave. He rose from the dead and won this for us. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that Jesus defeated death. He defeated death. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15.55, He says, he he actually trash talks death. And he says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh death, where is your your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of God is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus confirms the truth of Scripture. Over and over, it's been prophesied that the Messiah would be suffering dying and rising from the dead. Isaiah 53, I won't have time to read all of this, but it talks about, now think about Isaiah 53 verse 3. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering familiar with pain, like one of whom people hide their faces. He was despised. We held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, Crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. In other words, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And yet it was already describing Jesus. How powerful is that? And here's the thought. What God says, he will do. What he releases as a promise, he will actually fulfill. Number four. The resurrection of Jesus proves that he is the son of God. Right? Romans chapter 1 verse 4. He was declared by the Son of God to be the Son of God in accordance, in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Proves that he's the Son of God. Number five. The resurrection of Jesus gives us living hope. It gives us living hope. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the Father. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I today have a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not a wishful thinking. I I hope I'll go to heaven when I die. It's a living hope that when you confess Christ as Lord, when you give your life to Him as Lord and Savior, 
He becomes Lord and Savior of your life. This life, when it ends, after you breathe your last, the next second, you'll be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. That's your living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's a living hope. Amen? Number six, the resurrection of Christ or Jesus means that we also be resurrected like him. We will be resurrected like him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For as by a man came death. Who's this man that came death? Adam. By a man also came resurrection from the dead. Who's this man? Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall all be made alive. See, this body right here will be resurrected. Okay? Poke the person beside you. Okay? That, that body is going to get resurrected. Okay? Thanks be to God. All right? No more, no more sickness, no more illness, no more pain. Okay, I was talking to a, a bunch of senior citizens one day and says, you know, no more maintenance. Woo! They were all excited. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't know what the body will look like. Some say it'll be your prime. Some scholars say, so I, I don't know what would, how would you define your prime? 20s, 30s, right? I'm always on my prime, Pastor Paolo. Nax, diba? And so, verse 7, the resurrection of Jesus enables us to live a powerful life for His glory. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now He is far above every ruler or authority or power. What's he saying? Okay, the resurrection of Jesus enables us to live a powerful life for his glory. This is what Arby was saying earlier. He's telling about this. That the power available to you and to me is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know how powerful that is? Have you ever heard of anybody being resurrected from the dead? And so that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is on you and me today, available for us today. Question, okay, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power at work in our lives today. Are you living your life as though Jesus never rose from the dead? Because if we don't understand this truth, then we live life in, in, in defeated state or condition, not realizing Jesus won over sin, death, and the grave. I no longer have to perform. Listen, some of you, it may have been hard for you growing up because you had tried to perform and earn mom or dad's approval. Right? But you and I today, because of what Christ did for us, we, ha we have been approved. We belong. And you are now part of the family because of what Christ did for you. Jesus won that for you as well. Purchased that for you. The power of the resurrection has become the power to raise a dead person to life. A life that has been transformed. Okay, It's not self-help books, though they're helpful. It's not therapy, though they're helpful. Okay, It's not any worldly methods, although some of them are actually helpful. But what will actually transform your life is the power of God in His resurrection when He rose Jesus from the dead. Now, I want to call Moses up here. Moses is somebody who, uh, I, I've known him uh, since he was a kid, okay? Because uh, he was uh, one of our, I was a kid's church teacher and he was one of the kids. I was a kid's church teacher when I was 13 years old. Max, no, joke lang. But uh, Moses, will, I just wanted to share, have Moses come up and share his, his testimony because I, I, hear, I heard his testimony. We sat down one time for coffee and I said, Moses, that's so powerful. I, I want you to share that testimony because somebody who grew up in church and yet, you know, things happened along the way. I, I'll, I'll let him share it. I won't steal the thunder anymore, but just go ahead and maybe you can share your, your, your testimony. Let's give Moses a hand. Thank you, Pastor Paolo. Uh, good afternoon, church. My name is Moses. I uh, grew up here in church and in a Christian school, uh, in kids' church. And basically, there's a time where I tried to play ball in a prominent school. 
and uh, and really do well. So sabi ko, sige, graduate na lang ako. Then uh, I thought, that time I knew God. But then I realized that, uh, no, I didn't know Him at all. I fell deep into vices, and I made a series of bad decisions. Eventually, after a while, I thought to myself, I can't live this way anymore. What would my future family think of me? Or my current family think of me? So I tried to be a decent human being. I sobered up. I volunteered in kids' church. And I even got baptized. Eventually, this led me to focus on my ambition. So I fell deep into my career, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But then eventually, the toxicity and the pressure of my job, it just got to me. So this made me relapse into drugs. This time, my family found out. And I missed my second chance in life. So I lost my job. Uh, I failed my family. I uh, failed myself. And I felt like it was just a cycle of failure in my life. I felt I had no purpose. I had nothing to live for. So, Lord, uh, maybe it could just end here. Through the next few days, eventually it was locked down. God came to me slowly in a, in a gentle whisper. He spoke to my heart and he said, You know, Moses, I'm sure you know my power. I'm sure you know about this. You grew up in church and you know what I can do in your life. Uh, why not just try to go all out with me? Just this once. And then I said, might as well, God. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll give it a try. I'll give my all to you. When I started to know God's word a bit more, I realized that he was speaking through me, through his word. And then slowly looking back, I realized that I was experiencing his grace. Even in those little moments that I was pushing him away, God was there. His, his fingerprints was all over my life. And that time, I realized that I could... I can't help but just live for God. Eventually, this is when I understood that even in my failures, even when I was running away, God was there. That was when I finally understood God's love. This time, I could not deny that I just wanted to share His love to others. And I realized that if nothing can separate me from His love, then I might as well give my all and acknowledge it in my life. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Moses. I wanted him to share his testimony because, you know, some of you, you're new in church. Some of you, you grew up in church. But for him, he understood he still needed a relationship with Jesus. It can't be through mom or dad that you have a relationship with Jesus. It can't be through a church attendance that you have a relationship with Jesus. You're going to have to make that decision yourself to surrender your life to Christ. And I, Moses is actually now in full-time ministry serving the Lord full-time. Amen. Can we all stand? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming. Lord, some of us were just, we've heard it so many times, Lord. Easter has become just a regular day. But I pray, Lord, that today would be different. Lord, that there would be a greater understanding and realization of what you've done for us. And Lord, today, I ask that your spirit would move in all of our hearts. You're calling us by name. Some of us, you're calling us home. 
back into relationship with you. And Lord, let, let today be quite a special day because it's a day where Lord, you reached your hand out to ours telling us that shame no longer clothes you. Guilt no longer overwhelms you. Sin is no longer who you are. Your failure is no longer your identity. I am the resurrection and your life. I'm going to ask uh, Spiff to sing this song us, and then let's just sing this together.
I'm standing in that show. I stand complete. Jesus died my soul to say. My lips will repeat this word. Jesus died my soul to say. Leaves will repeat this word. Jesus died my soul to save, and that's what I'm gonna sing over and over. Jesus died my soul to save. close in prayer, we just, Pastor Paolo and I, we just want to take this time to pray for two groups of people. You see, for some of you here today, I just want to let you know that it's not an accident why God has brought you to this place for such a time as this to hear this message. And maybe for some of you here today, while, while Pastor Paolo was preaching, you felt that tug in your heart and say, finally, maybe this is the day wherein you give your life to Christ. If you're here and you're that person and you haven't made that decision to surrender your life to Christ and, and make Him as your Lord and Savior, is it possible that the, this is the day that the Lord has made? That's the reason why He brought you to this place. If that's you and you want to make that commitment to surrender your life to Christ and, and to make Him your Lord and Savior with any, without anybody looking around, just quickly raise up your hand so that we can take this time to pray for you. You're here and you haven't made that decision to surrender your life to Christ and you want to say, Lord, I want to give my life to you. I see that hand at the side. See that hand in the front. See that hand at the back. Thank you, Lord. If that's you and you're raising up your hand and you want to make that decision, I... Kindly pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done on the cross for me. Today, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, I make this decision before you to surrender my life to you. And from this day forward, I choose you to be the Lord and the master of my life. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins and for the things that I have done. And today, Lord, by your grace and strength, I want to live my life for you from today for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. One more group of people we would like to pray for. Maybe for some of you here today, you've been a Christian for a long time. You grew up here in church and probably... You heard something from the testimony of Moses earlier and you felt like today is the day wherein you recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you're here and you've been 
running away from God and maybe you feel like you've done so much and you feel like you can't be forgiven. But just like what Moses shared, he shared his, his testimony to all of us. There is forgiveness. There is redemption. There is restoration. If you're here and you're saying you're done with the running away from God and you want to follow Him once again, I want you to raise up your hand as a sign of humility before the Lord. Lord, you see the hands of these people raising up. Lord, you see the humility before, you see the humility in their hearts. And today, Lord, they are just coming back to you and saying, Lord, they're done with running away. And they want to recommit their lives before you. They want to get rid of their life of sin and live for you once again. And Lord, we thank you for you have said in your word that you oppose the proud but give grace to the humble. And Lord, as they humble themselves, themselves before you once again, Lord, we pray for grace upon grace to turn away from their life of sin and follow you and live for you once again. Surround these people, Father, with people who can help them, who will journey with them. And Lord, as they make this decision to once again live for you, Lord, I pray that you're going to remove all form of shame and guilt and condemnation in their hearts. Silence the voice of the enemy lying to them and condemning them for the things that they have done and remind them and paint this picture in their hearts and minds that as they have made this decision to come back to you, you are running to them, embracing them, welcoming them them back into your home, into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. As we end, can we all just lift our hands before the Lord? Lord, we thank you. And as we end in celebration today, celebrating that you have risen, Lord, I speak a word of blessing upon your people. And Lord, as they go back to work, as they go back to their families, Lord, we pray that they will carry that resurrection power with them, bringing life to the people around them, to their office mates, to their campuses, Father. And Lord, we pray that they will themselves experience that resurrecting power in their lives. Lord, we send them off with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all end with a celebration song today.